Hey guys, and welcome to the first FTC Fridays of this FTC season. Um, we've got an awesome guest here. He's our intern for the summer. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Imans. I am from Seattle, Washington, team 4042 non-standard, oh, wrong, sorry, 4042 <laughs> non-standard deviation. Uh, and I've been interning here for about six weeks. Yep, so this is actually your last day here, unfortunately. Um, this, so we're going to stream for your last hour of your internship. Um, so we have some awesome stuff to talk to you guys about today. Um, first and foremost, the new FTC kit that I'm sure a lot of you guys noticed went live um, the start of this week. Uh, we also have a new Strafer chassis that includes some unreleased parts. That chassis will go live during the stream. So keep an eye out for that on the website, um, and I think we'll probably let you know when it's live. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the stream, ping us in the chat. You can ping at GoBuildATV, uh, and we're going to actually start our giveaway pretty soon here. Um, we also have some pretty cool things that kind of tie into the FTC kit that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So. We can kind of get right back into a couple of new parts we've released since Worlds last year. The first one, and the one that I am the most excited about, is the hinge blocks. So hinge blocks are kind of our new, really modular hinge. Um, they are injection mold build plastic, um, and they let you build out a hinge to kind of your specifications. So if you need a hinge that's really wide, or if you need a hinge that is um, specifically narrow or in specific locations, they let you do that. The other nice part about them is because they're injection molded, um, they are really affordable. So you can get 25 for 10 bucks. For an FTC team, yeah. 25 for 750. Um, so you can get a bunch of different uh, assemblies put together with just some of those in screws. We also sell hinge blocks as a two pack of hinges. So that comes with um, the ability to make two, it's actually this, this assembly right here, the ability to make two little three hinge block wide hinges for your robot assemblies. Um, I really like these, I'm excited. I think they're gonna be really nice for stuff like electronics panels um, and like other really kind of fairly low load applications where you need stuff to swivel. Yeah. The other place I really like them is when you need to build a solid joint that is um, at a specific angle. So this assembly right here has some linkages and then it has hinge blocks down inside the, the center to get like a very modular specific angle. So I really like because of that, uh, I really like the ability to kind of do a bunch of different things with them. I think they're going to be really fun and modular and like a really quick and cheap way to get up to do those things. So um, we should be able to, That's these are one of the new things that are included in the FTC kit. You get a pack of hinge blocks to do about whatever with. Um, I think it looks like the audio is just in the right ear. You should be able to right cl or yeah, click the settings in advanced audio. And then there's a stereo check bark checkbox. That checkbox to the left. I think that's the stereo. Yeah, that should be fixed. Okay. Um, and we'll see if we get our second camera back. It's up in the air still. Um, so that's one of the things we changed about the FTC kit. The FTC kit this year, honestly, is kind of some small refinements. We really are happy with where it was last year. Um, and that was, to refresh some memories, that was when we switched to 8Rex. So 8Rex kind of started on the scene about when I started working here at GoBuilda, so about three years ago. Um, and we slowly switched everything over. And at this point, we're really solidly 8Rex. So this is the second year of an 8Rex FTC kit, and we were really happy with it. The other, the, one of the small improvements we made was we switched the collars to be uh, four set screw collars instead of two clamping collars. So a bit of a sidestep there, I'd say. Um, and then drop center. drop center plates. So those are, um, I don't have one just, yeah, I don't have a, just one, but they, they got improved. So they are now narrower. So they fit between motors. They're, they're a little more usable. They're a little nicer. And they've got bearing counter wars, whereas the old ones were just kind of 2D parts. So I'm really excited about those. And they're also injection molded, which means we can do a little more fancy geometry with them. Exactly. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, I really like those updates. Um, we also, I suppose we can just get right into it. This is kind of the thing we haven't talked about yet, we haven't released, um, and what you've been working on all summer. Yeah. So we developed um, a what we're calling a rookie handbook for FTC teams this year, especially rookie teams, and especially rookie teams who are new to go build up. Mm -hmm. So this year, um, we are jumping into that with a bunch of different ways to 
put together, really one primary way, to put together this kind of starter robot. So if you're familiar with the Tetrix Pushbot, I know I was, it was the first thing I ever built in FTC. This is kind of a similar idea where it is a drivetrain with an arm um, and that lets you kind of get up and running kind of agnostic of the season. So this build is very similar to one that we beta tested last year for people who bought the FTC kit. Um, we sent out some instructions and kind of let them go build it and give us feedback on it. And it's very similar, but it has a bunch of improvements, mostly in kind of the usability and maintainability of it. So it is set up here with a rev hub. It runs on stock pushbot code, though we've, I've modified a little bit. I turn on brake mode. I turn the, the arm motor to full speed. Um, I'm really excited about it. So really the goal of this is to get rookie teams up to speed way faster than they could otherwise. So do you have anything you want to talk about about it specifically? You really kind of primar primarily pushed on the handbook specifically. Right. So what you mentioned at the end there, uh, getting teams up to speed quickly has been a struggle for our FTC team from year to year, right? You get mm -hmm. a bunch of new members, you don't know how to train them and balance building a robot. This is the, I, in my opinion, I think it's the best way to do so. Um, the, the handbook basically leads you through a guide to building this, but instead of just an assembly guide like from Lego or whatever else, you get um, detailed information about the engineering principles and design concepts that go behind every mechanism. So rather than understanding, oh, this is just how you put together a wheel shaft, you understand what supporting shafts means and constraining them axially and that kind of stuff. And it ties into a bunch of other um, external sources if you want to do further research. Right. Um, I'm really excited about that. Can I double check your microphone real quick? I'm yes. sorry. I know somebody mentioned that we couldn't hear you. Uh, did it die? It potentially. Ah. Uh, well, can I grab another battery for these? Or there's a backup mic, right? Uh, there should be another charger. Yeah. Oh, there is sorry. a backup mic. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, and I, I know Abby mentioned the, in the chat, go build competing with GM1, more like GM, uh, GM0, more like GM0 finally doesn't need to exist, thank God. We really, I really love GM0. I personally have, have helped with it a little bit. I think you have also helped with it some. <laughs> Maybe you should grab the backup mic. Um, this really isn't geared to compete with GM0. It's more of a, the, like, it's almost more based on curriculum. The, the hope is that somebody who has never touched a robot, like even maybe never worked with very much mechanical stuff, um, can take this guide and build not only a robot, but sort of get to the part of the design process where they're understanding what's going on. So this might be, you know, you get an understanding of motors, you get an understanding of levers and how those affect things and torque and speed. Um, and just like overall mechanical principles where the, the flow will be, okay, I'm going to go build this little piece of the chassis and I'm going to learn something while I'm doing it. Um, and the next, as you kind of work through assembling this robot, you learn more about building robots and mechanical, like mechanical systems in general. Absolutely. So we're really excited about how, like having that, having that as a resource for rookie teams and newer teams who are getting into GoBuilda and newer students on existing teams. Um, I know your team has been around forever, so I think that'll be hopefully a resource for teams like yours to train up new students who are just getting into GoBuilda Absolutely. and just getting into FTC. And so. on that subject, we're looking for volunteer teams to <laughs> help beta test this new yeah. um, mechanical handbook. So yep. if you or your team or you know somebody who might be interested and you have access to a master kit, um, please shoot us an email. Yep. Uh, you can email uh, either marketing at gobuilda.com or tech at gobuilda.com. Either one of those will get you um, some information there on how you can test it out. Um, it's built out of the FTC starter kit, the new kit. Um, it, it includes every piece you need. And the one of the goals of that is that that kit also includes um, a bunch of additional parts so you can go modify that chassis to learn more. That's That's literally... Oh, that's, <laughs> I was like, that's literally not GM0. I misunderstood. I would agree. It is not GM0. Um, I think, I don't know if we have, I think we do uh, mention GM0 in it. Yeah, at one point we talked about If we don't, we should. Yeah. I think we do. So that's a great option. Um, Stargamer285, does the handbook include wiring and programming for the expansion hub? Uh, it doesn't right now. It's all hardware. So the there's actually a first specific guide that goes over in a lot of detail getting everything set up to run the the control hub and phones. If you're using two phones, an expansion hub or a control hub, 
Um, so we're going to link to that. I think that's actually a really good guide. But if you like so. what you see mechanically and you want to see the same kind of stuff with electrical, pester first about letting us use um, Go Build <laughs> Electronics, right? Send, send them a petition. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely mention it. Like if, if you, um, after we release this, I don't know of an exact day for when we're going to get this out there for teams, um, but it will be fairly soon. So like if you get this and you use it to train teams or train rookie members, use it to pass along to rookie teams you start, absolutely like let us know how it goes let us yes. know how we can improve it like this is meant to be kind of a living changing document that we can keep updating and keep improving as the season goes on and hopefully as the years go on right and the most important part it is free free for everyone it's mm -hmm. this is not going to be behind a paywall you don't have to buy the, the starter right. kit in order to have access to the education stuff yeah so we want this really just out there in the open um, mm -hmm. um EP52, consider including relevant product insights, if not already included in the handbook. I don't think we do. We, we have product insights just without all of like the extra Go Build right. logos and stuff. Yeah, we're very, it's very similar to the idea of a product insight. I think, yes. Yeah, this is kind of the, the extension of a product insight in a little bit. So yeah, I'm really excited about it. I have it up, actually up and running. It's running on a control hub, like I mentioned. So it's got a couple of modifications to pushbot code. If you just plug it in, pushbot code will run on it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a couple things that I like to change in pushbot code for this robot. The biggest one is setting the default brake behavior, the default motor behavior to brake. Um, that helps drive the robot around a lot, and it also helps the arm keep its position. So the arm will hold its position um, just with brake mode. So you don't need run to position. I would still definitely recommend it. And it's a great kind of add-on step to learning more. What, 25 to 1 and 20 to 1, so, or 19.2 19.2 so. times 5 times 5. It yeah. is 480 to 1, um, which is a surprisingly perfect number. Well, because you're multiplying by 25, so any decimal point two zeros. That's true. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, um, so 480 to 1, it is crazy torque. Yes. Um, it will lift, you say, 15 pounds so, at the end of the arm? Uh, at the end of the arm, it's optimized for 15 pounds, which means <laughs> that it's, it's outputting maximum motor power. And that, that's the section that the, the handbook talks about is like motor powers and power curves, if you've never heard of those. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's great for lifting things at 15 pounds. Anything less than that, it breezes past. And it can lift, I think, up to um, right around 40 is the stall torque um, like at normal lifting locations. Yeah. Um, and so. It's wild. So <laughs> it is really a very, it's an overbuilt system so that it will, it will keep position um, without run to position. Mm -hmm. um, it also means, I, I, I kind of will have a probably difficult time showing it. It will relic recovery hang, which I love. Um, and overall, it's, I think, a pretty solid setup. The end of the arm has a claw. It is two torque servos with gecko wheels mounted, just solidly mounted. They don't spin mm -hmm. at the end. So you, can, you have a decent amount of grip where you can grab something and pick it up. Um, I really do enjoy that specific aspect of it. I'm really happy with it. Um, and like the speed that, that servos move, those servos move is another thing that I like to change and refine in the pushbot code. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Um, oh, not Relic Recovery Climb. Correct. Uh, Rover Ruckus Hang. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> hang on the crypto box to flex on the haters. Stargamer285. Yeah, that's correct. That's actually, the rumor has it, that's how Brainstem's robot got turned off. No. Uh, sorry. That's how Mechanical Paradox's robot got <clears> turned <throat> off. They, they hung on the crypto box too much. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm really happy with it. It's a six-wheel drive. It's a two-motor six-wheel drive. So there's definitely room to add more motor power if you need to. Um, it's got gears and then chain to power the every wheel in the setup. So yeah, I'm excited for you guys to see that document and give us some feedback and kind of work for it uh, or work towards making it even better. I'm really excited about it. So yes. They got rid of... Oh, uh, somebody's asking why mm -hmm. two-motor drive? Is that... Yeah. Hmm, one, two, three? <laughs> yes. That's why two-motor drive. And the reason being that leaves you with lots of options for future expansion, right? So right. we've got currently three motors. There's four in the starter kit, which leaves you with one for an intake mechanism or some flywheel or something else. Yep. And really, two motors on a tank drive is the minimum to have a functional FDC robot. Yeah. Um, can I talk about modules? Um, probably not. Okay. I think we'll keep cool. those for All later. Right. Um, but I think that's kind of the main thing. One of the... 
one of the things that I really like to talk to teams about is um, when you go buy a, an FTC starter kit, you probably want to look at getting a drivetrain in addition to it, or at least more motors. Um, we include four motors in the starter kit. That's kind of the standard across all of the FTC-focused starter kits in the industry. Um, and we like that because it pairs really well with the Mechanum uh, drivetrains and the strafers. It also pairs really well with V-lines, so that when you're done, you have eight motors. You can go run a full robot, and you can have access to all of the motors possible. So that makes the starter kit and the, the strafer a really good combination. Um, and I'm especially excited about that combination of two parts. Um, let's see here. Oh, we have some oh, more chats. Ancient World says, what's your prediction for power play? Um, well, everybody doesn't... saw the leak, right? Oh, it's yeah, for so, sure. so real. It's definitely <laughs> that. I don't know. Um, yeah, we don't see the game early, so I'm really not sure. Um, but I'm really excited to see what it offers. It, we're not honestly that far from kickoff, so yeah. I'm pumped to see what teams do with it. Um, I'm especially excited for Robot in three days. I think that we have more guests this year. We should have three guests on team, two more from a, a team I bet most of you probably know. I bet people still know them. They weren't aligned last year, but they were really, really good from for a lot of years. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. I'm really excited about it. Um, I love, oh, <laughs> V5 Live, it looks like it to me. It very well might be. I think that's a great time to talk about the version 5 of the Strafer chassis. So we'll move this away, we'll turn it off, um, and then we'll get out version 5. So outwardly, it looks very similar. Like from here, you probably can't tell. Um, it has, the pow powertrain is really where we wanted to improve it. So. The feedback we got from teams last year about Strafer Chassis V4 is that it could be a little more reliable. The big thing was that it relies on set screws to uh, axially constrain the shaft. So those set screws could um, loosen up over time over driving the robot, and then your mechanum wheel could slide out on the shaft. The shaft couldn't fall all the way out, but your robot still looked pretty silly. So that was the big thing we wanted to improve, and we went through a lot of different iterations for how you could um, improve that and increase that reliability. And we ended up on an entirely new part. So we have a brand new way of running uh, miter gears. We still use the same miter gears uh, in the setup, but we have a new shaft and built-in hub. So we call it a hub shaft. It's a really neat way to run um, wheeled wheels and powertrain setups in channel. So our close-up camera doesn't seem to be working right now. So we don't have a great way to show you the- you Just run over there. Yeah, that's true. I can show you a close up. Um, but it basically is an 8-rex shaft, but has some shoulders for running to run on round bearings, and then has a hub output on the end. So it is a really robust setup, and the key part of it is that now that shaft is actually constrained by an M4 screw in the end of the shaft. So it will um, allows you to really tighten down on the the shaft and allows you to really easily check that screw and keep it tight. But we think this is going to be a lot more reliable for people to run those chassis. Um, and one of the things I mentioned really briefly was um, it's on the round bearings. It runs a six millimeter ID and an eight millimeter ID round bearing. It just makes that really smooth. It gets the precision up even further because that part of the shaft is round. It will run just like for a crazy long time and crazy precisely. So I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a pretty good improvement. Um, the other thing it offers is it's got a shoulder in here for the miter gear to locate against. So assembling that portion of the chassis just got crazy easy because your your parts are you have two bearings, you have a hub shaft, and you have a miter gear. <laughs> and that's it. So you put those things together, you slide the miter gear up against the shoulder. You could take the set, set screws out if you wanted to, um, but they do help kind of cut down on the backlash in that system. One other change we made to simplify stuff is we've removed the thrust bearings. Mm -hmm. So after extensive testing with the radial bearings, we realized that the thrust forces coming off of FTC robots and miter gears, they're not even close to like breaking the, the bearings themselves. And right. so this is an increase in efficiency again by removing extra friction from thrust bearings. Um, yep. So I yeah. think that's going to be a really sweet option for teams. They run crazy smooth. Um, 
the other change you made is so there are there used to be thrust bearings on, behind the miter gear on the driven shaft. There also was a thrust bearing behind the miter gear on the driving shaft that the motor was on. So that switched over to spacers, and it specifically switched over to a spacer and a couple of shims. Um, so that lets you really fine tune and adjust the mesh depending on exactly how you like it. You may like something that's really tight and gives you really low backlash. I mean, we're still talking about a very small amount of backlash. Or you might something, like something that's just ridiculously smooth um, and maybe has just a tick more backlash. Mm -hmm. So you have some options there for how you want to design your chassis and how you want to um, go ahead and like put everything together and make it run. So you don't need the set screws at all anymore, do you? Nope. No set screws. No set screws are required. I still would put them in because they reduce the backlash. Mm -hmm. You still have a little bit of backlash between an 8-rex bore and an 8-rex shaft just because we can't make that a press fit and still have those parts assemblable by every team with just hand tools. So they do cut down the backlash a little bit more, but they could all fall out in the middle of a match and your robot's still going to drive. Um, so that is kind of all comes down to that screw is now the important one to keep in. And you can really crank down on yeah. it and it will stay in place. So I'm really excited about yeah. that. I think it's going to be, it's simpler, it's easier to put together, and it will be more reliable. So V5 is honestly another one of those things that feels like um, a refinement more than a big version um, like the FTC kit was. Mm -hmm. So if you're using smaller gears, I think it would help increase the linear thrust force, so then maybe still helpful on the 2 to 1 kit. Um, I think that's interesting. I would have to think about that more. Um, interesting. So the would, would thrust bearings be more beneficial on the 2 to 1 bevels than the 1 to 1 bevels? They would be more beneficial, but the keyword is more. Um, yeah. It's not, it's, they would still reduce performance in the long run because you're not subjecting the bearings to stresses that would cause them to break under FTC loads, unless you're running this on like a huge arm with like stupid amounts right. of torque. That's where um, you really get the advantage is you get, a t if you have an application where you have just a ton of torque going through those, that will increase the thrust load that's generated by them. Mm -hmm. um, and in those cases, yeah, I think they're totally great. They're still a great way to set the spacing on those miter gears. Yeah. So I still really like them for those applications. I think we should run back to start a giveaway. So the first thing we need to give away today is our is a hoodie. Um, I will get in and turn that on. Um, and then you're going to type in a keyword in the chat. Um, yeah, you take it away. Yeah, while that's getting set up, I can talk a little bit more about the hub shafts and their mm -hmm. applications. So one of the things that it really allows you to do is with the same like low part count, get really compact mounting. So probably my favorite application is the um, the Omni wheel. So normally, you, you know, with the Omni wheels, you have to have two that are clocked 180 degrees um, in order to have them spin uh, and travel sideways. And to, to put that spacing in there, you need like a pattern spacer. And that's an extra part. And um, there's more screws that have to pass through here. But the hub shaft eliminates the, the hub and the pattern spacer because it acts as both. You've got, um, I don't know, it's not visible because it's very compact, but the hub shaft is running in between the two, um, the two Omni wheels which means that when you tighten um, the, the screws running through here, and we have lock nuts on the outside, screws on the inside, so you could remove this without even having to take off the shaft first, mm -hmm. um, then you get omni wheels that are really, really close to the channel, letting you put more crossbar width, and it still runs like stupid smooth. Yeah, I think um, this is probably, this is one of my favorite parts of the hub shaft, is that it makes you make this mechanism set up just so compact and so nice. Um, because it does get rid of the width of the hub because your hub is in between them. So that's one of the reasons we picked four millimeters is the width of that um, hub, you could say, um, is it can sit in between Omni wheels and provide a really great uh, option to mount them. Uh, it's also pretty darn good at running my uh, Rhino wheels. Um, so that's a thin Rhino wheel, and it actually gets um, one millimeter away from the yeah, wall of the channel. It's about a millimeter of clearance, right. which... <laughs> it's pretty close. You could flip it around and you'd have nine millimeters. Yeah. Um, that's probably how I would run it most of the time because you could still run socket heads on the channel. But that's also a great way to run narrow rhinos. It could, it's a great way to run wide rhino wheels. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even run our huge traction wheels with the addition of a little uh, plastic pattern spacer. 
So that's awesome. It also integrates pretty well with our new drop center plates. You can see the narrower design of the drop center plate here. You can even run a drop center with these, which I think is really nice and especially special. So you see you put them both on the same side of the channel and that keeps your spacing within half a millimeter. You then add a little shim and it gets all fine and dandy. So I do think these are really nice. Um, I know it was mentioned in the chat that they are uh, about $12. I'm pretty sure that's correct. I'd have to double check. Those are, it's about the same price as buying a hub and a shaft. So in a lot of applications where you're running a miter gear, it's an easy, easy buy. It may be not quite as flexible. You can do a little bit less with it. 2106, the standard Rex shafting, absolutely still has a place in Gobilda. Mm -hmm. But this is really nice when you're running drivetrains, when you're running miter gears, um, and when you just like need something right off the end of channel. So it's one more piece of reliability that I think you get from your robots. So For sure. I think it's really awesome. Uh, Auxiliary Moose says, oh my god, I think I was on a robotics team with one of the hosts. This is so exciting. I, I think so too. Yeah, I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty sure that, that would probably be the case. Maybe not. It could be somebody pretending to be him. Um, that's true. That's, that's possible. Uh, will there be other sizes of shoulder shafts? I think there may be. Um, that's something we'll look at in the future. I'm pretty darn happy with the length we ended up here. It's about the same as you'd get with a hyperhub offset. <laughs> so almost all of our wheels are designed with that hyperhub and bearing in mind. Uh, you have a 20 millimeters of offset from the mounting face to the bearing. So your overall offset from the channel is 21 millimeters. So all of our wheels are, th are thought about through the perspective of a hyperhub, so they all work really well with this. Um, so if we find a need that we do want to go make a different length uh, hub shaft for, I think we will. Um, but right now, this is the only one that's planned just because it does fit most things pretty well. If you need an extra long one, you could run a coupler off, like an 8-rex coupler to, yes. to some other shaft and then have that run over the, the end of the thing if you needed like an extra long Potentially, hub yeah. Like. I think the at that case, you probably just grab a rex shaft For and sure. run the more traditional uh, shaft and hub perspective, uh, like setup. Mm -hmm. um, that still is going to be the most flexible option if you're looking to get parts that you're going to go reuse every single time. I'm probably still going to grab a hub and a shaft because they are just a little more flexible. You can do a little more with them. Um, but when you're getting something that's specific to a use case or you know you're always going to run with a wheel, they're great. Um, and they're just awesome for running uh, miter gears. I just love them for that specifically. So is this like an 8-rex bore pattern? Is this like an 8-rex bore pattern spacer at the end of the shaft? That's pretty similar to what you end up with, yeah. Um, the, the, do we have a 3 mil hex key by chance? Uh, we'll see if it works. That is a 760 oh, fourths. Haha, it did work. Nice. Don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's very similar. It's got shouldered sections. So uh, working from the pattern end, you have a standard go build a hole pattern. Um, you have the 16 millimeter square with uh, in tapped holes. Then you also have the 16 millimeter square uh, through holes that are slotted to the 24 millimeter circle. That section of the hub is 14 millimeters thick. Uh, for, excuse me, four millimeters thick, and it has the 14 millimeter extrusion on the front side and the back sides to locate things that, like wheels, sprockets, or pulleys that you would run on that shaft. It then has a 12 millimeter section. That is to go right up against the face of a flanged bearing or any bearing, um, and it also adds some really sweet strength. Uh, it all, I also think it looks pretty cool. Uh, then it necks down to eight millimeters round, um, eight millimeter round shaft, uh, and that extends for uh, uh, one, three and a half, five and a half, uh, eight and a half millimeters. Uh, it extends for eight and a half millimeters. So five of those are going to be held, uh, kind of slotted over by the bearing. And that leaves you the right amount of space to then go slide a miter gear on it. That miter gear will sit up against the end of the 8 millimeter portion where it turns into an 8 millimeter rex shaft and that locates that correctly at the right spacing. So that's all you would do there to get that correct spacing for miter gears. I also like that. So that number is 5 millimeters from the channel wall. I think that's an especially nice unit because it's 1 millimeter more than a socket head cap screw. So it leaves your power transmission, if you're running a belt or a pull or like a sprocket and chain, it leaves that further away from the channel wall than your socket heads would be and lets you still mount stuff to that face without worrying about getting in the way of your power transmission. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then you have an eight millimeter Rex portion of the shaft for driving components, pulleys, sprockets, miter gears, all that good stuff. And then it necks down to six millimeters where the six millimeter bearing would go in. Um, and that extends for just over five millimeters. So that means all of the parts of the shaft that have uh, bearings running on them are running on round parts of the shaft. So you run round bearings, it's super high tolerance and it's just super yeah, low smooth. Tolerance. Lo super tight tolerance. There we go. <laughs> um, and then it has a four millimeter thread in the end for you to run a screw and a washer. And a key thing here is you run both of the bearings from the outside of the channel, which yep. makes assembly and disassembly like so easy because you just undo one screw and the entire shaft pops out, as opposed to having to undo a hub and then sliding the wheel off and then pulling out an E-clip or reversing miter gears and undoing stuff. It's way easier to work with. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked why the last bit is six millimeters and not eight millimeters. That's so that it can run on a round, uh, so that you can still have that round bearing running on a round shaft and you can still install parts onto the shaft. Eight, install, install eight millimeter Rex parts onto the shaft. Right, if it was eight millimeter round on the end, you couldn't get the miter gear across. Right. Because it's too small. Yep, exactly. So uh, somebody asked what the what are the updates to the strafer. It runs a new, uh, more robust shaft setup um, and a little bit simpler assembly. So I'm really pumped about the new strafer. I think it's going to be really awesome for a lot of teams. Um, and I'm, I am very excited for what teams are going to do with it. Um, so I think they mentioned that's live. You can go look at it on the site. Um, the CAD file and everything is up, and so are the hub shafts. So if you're excited about using them in an application, go take a look at them, see if they fit in. Um, and if you have some especially neat use cases for them, uh, show them off. So send us an email to tech at gobilla.com, or if you're, if you're on the FTC Discord, post in there and tag me. Um, I am excited to see some cool use cases for this, because this is kind of a new style of product for us. We've done a hub shaft before on the new versions of the servo gearboxes. Uh, those worked really well, and we were pumped about them. So we kind of took that and moved it over into the, into the uh, strafer chassis. Should we mention the 150? Uh, I, we should. I need to make sure and figure out when that goes live. Got it. So that was the thing I forgot to check is when our sponsorships go live for the season. But uh, they are going to. We're going to do a very similar sponsorship to last year. So uh, in the past and this year, we have done a sponsorship where 150 teams get a strafer chassis for $150. Um, this is especially nice for rookie teams and teams who need a chassis. The chassis is the part of the robot that I think is the most frustrating when it breaks because you just can't drive around. And a lot of times, there's not a whole lot the teams know that they did wrong and can go fix. So that's one of the reasons I really like it. I think it's one of the best things for a rookie team to get into FTC. So that's one of the reasons that we chose the Strafer chassis for that sponsorship. Um, so we will open applications fairly soon. It'll still be early August. Um, and that will, at that point, you can go apply. We're going to pick 50 teams at the start of August, or at the end of August, 50 teams at the end of September, and 50 teams at the end of October. Um, and those teams will all be able to go buy the Strafer chassis for $150. We pick the uh, at different times because some teams are already registered and already like really excited to get started for the season and want to go to their kickoff with the chassis uh, or start right away with something that they know they can start prototyping on. Some teams don't even know they're going to be a team yet. So we want to be able to catch everybody, and especially, I think especially rookie teams end up being that late category. And I think those are the teams who need support the most. So that's kind of why we, we spread that out a little bit um, and let a lot of different people have an opportunity. It's still definitely better to get your application in early. If you are sure you're going to compete this year, go ahead and, and apply, because um, it means you can be in the drawing or in the selection process for each of the rounds. I think that'll be really good. Um, OK. We'll figure out exactly when that's launching, if we know exactly when. Um, but for now, I think we should probably roll for our giveaway and then start the next one, I think. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we've got a lot of people in here. We'll go ahead and close those entries, uh, and then we'll pick a winner. So Ancient Worlds Z? Ancient Worlds? No, word. Words. Can't read today. Yeah. Uh, kind of ironic in this case. You uh, please email us over at marketinggobilla.com. Let him know like who you are, what you want, and give him your shipping info. Uh, and also uh, mention what size hoodie you want, and then we'll get a hoodie sent over to you. And then 
we're going to give away a hub shaft, two hub shafts, two hub shafts, with, two hub shafts with bearings and a piece of channel so that you can go put one of these setups together for yourself and uh, like figure out how they work, feel how, how nice they are. So that should, that's actually going to be the same keyword. It's going to be exclamation mark mechanum. So enter to win. If you already entered, we'll have to have you enter again. Sorry about that. But this will pick another team. OK. Um, let's see here. Based on the number of incorrectly assembled strapers in the world, I think this is a great change. That is something that we, that was one of the reasons we simplified it. I think that it's, that's always a, a trade off, right? Because on the one hand, you have a lot of parts and you get to teach people about different kinds of bearings. Mm -hmm. And I know that's really cool. But I also saw a lot that weren't correct. So there are the ups and downs. I think this is going to be a good change overall. Um, and I think that a lot of teams will end up with probably a better experience because of this, um, especially those rookie teams who need help with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we're going to be opening those applications next week. So check back with us next week. If you aren't already, subscribe to our newsletter uh, or follow us on social media. We're going to post about this both of those places. So like, figure out, get in the loop, and uh, apply when you guys can. OK. Uh, what do you submit for school ID stuff if you are a community team? That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, if it's about the uh, team discount, I think you might be on the education discount page. Um, so the education discount is 15%, and that's for everybody. Like If you're a part of the school, if you're a club, uh, or if you're a class, you'd apply for that. But if you're an FTC team, make sure you're on the FTC discount page um, and get the 25% off discount. So I don't believe that that page doesn't require student ID or anything like that. Yeah. OK. Uh, would Gabilla like to sponsor some parts for a differential swerve in to get a GM0 review of swerve? Uh, email us at marketinggabilla.com. If you have questions like that, um, definitely let us know. Uh, do you know when eight Rex bearings will be back in stock? I don't. Um, I think you may be the same person who asked on Discord. I will find out for you Monday, and I'll let you know then. OK. So um, I kind of want to circle back to the FTC kit. I really like sure. it. I want to talk about that a little bit more. OK. So I'm, I'm especially excited about this because I it's something that I've wanted for a long time. I've talked to a lot of people who are just brand new to FTC, brand new to building stuff, and need some help with it. So I think it'd be cool to touch on this. I also recognize that we have a lot of people who are pretty smart in the stream. So if you guys mentioned, like, notice something about this robot that you think we could improve, like, mention it. Yeah. We might take a look at it. Um, at the end of the, the guide yep. document, quick start, handbook manual, mm -hmm. whatever we're calling it, um, there's a feedback form, so feel free to give us any feedback. Any and all feedback is much appreciated. Yeah. Um, Ethan mentioned this is a living document, and the goal is really to have something that, in the long run, ends up helping as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's written in the kind of language that's hopefully accessible to most people. Mm -hmm. So even though it covers some advanced topics, um, uh, it should be understandable for like middle and high school students. Um, yeah. We're really striving to. I don't know. I didn't grab a lot of stuff to I did not grab a lot of stuff to grab, um, ah. but that is something that I like a lot about this. This will grab everything from those uh, yellow cubes that have been used in four games now, uh, to the six-inch foam cubes that you get in um, Relic Recovery. Third drawer, there's a cube. There's a cube. Oh, oh from the bottom. Oh. That's second. Oh, that's the second drawer. I can't count there today. We Aha! Nice. We have the yellow cube. Um, so it has a really wide range. My hope is that teams will still go and like modify this to figure out exactly what they need. It's help if I have the servos go in the right direction. And it can go all the way back around for games where a pass through would be advantageous. We actually uh, apparently have a sky stone and a uh, relic. relic recovery. Did I say Rovaruckus the last time? I don't, I don't know. I keep getting them mixed up. So this was kind of the season this claw was almost designed around. Um, it was when I was first looking at this robot. It was in Skystone, and it works pretty all right. It's not a great 
robot for Skystone because right, yeah. it is not uh, your your cube rotates as you lift it up. But if you were to put like a four bar linkage on the end, yeah, right? that um, would be perfect. Then exactly. Yeah. So that's a great example. And then the film cubes kind of stretch what you can grab with it. I always go the wrong direction there. Um, but yeah, the relic recovery would be an all right here for the push bots, just yeah. in its stock configuration. Uh, and Skystone would too if your primary goal was uh, feeding teams. Yes. So that's kind of where this is meant to be, is a, is a universal starter robot that a team can go build and then modify, and then figure out like what they need to do to fit into the season really well. There's a lot of discussion about your swerve, your Diffie swerve. Oh. Uh, which is not right. surprising. Um, yeah, I unfortunately have not had, I've been working on the education kit because I think that's going to help more people in the long run than a differential swerve made out of Google parts. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah. it's something that it would probably work in theory. Unfortunately, we'll, we won't find out, at least for a while. Yeah, not so, this summer, at least, sorry. probably. So <laughs> it is very cool, though. And I think it kind of shows how you can use Gobilla parts to build a lot of different parts, a lot of different assemblies, and yeah. basically pretty close to complete. Uh, yeah. Let's see, how are you doing on giveaway entries? We have more people this time, so that's Ooh. great. If you haven't already, you should enter to win the giveaway. Because um, this is going to be an awesome one. So it, we have more viewers than giveaway entries by a lot. So a lot of you guys haven't. You should because I want to give away some hub shafts. RA3D go swerve. That's probably a little out of scale. Maybe. <laughs> Potentially. If the game makes sense. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see like what drive trains we should pick. Yeah. Um, I really love six-wheel drives. I love six-wheel drives. They've been uh, close to my heart the entire time I've been in FTC. But my cannon wheels are so good. They are. They are so competitive. And they're really awesome. So it would probably be hard. The last two robot in three days, we've ran Mechanum drivetrains because they're so good. So we'll see. We might, maybe this will be the year of six-wheel drive and we'll run a beeline in the, in the robot in three days. I don't know. I'd like to. Uh, RA3D Butterfly, uh, that would be fun. Also, probably out of scale. Yeah. Um, maybe more in scale, though. Maybe a little bit. Uh, I want to see a go build a FRC robot. Check out Tech Garage. I don't remember their number. It's 5-9 something. They're from Florida. Uh, but they're an FRC team that uses go build parts. They're a really cool program. Um, and they have a bunch of teams, and they talk to, like, they work with so many students. Um, and get to them to the point where they're working with robots. They do a robot drone league where they have like FT, like bigger than FTC robots and drones that have to compete together. They're great. Um, so they did pretty well in 2019. Yes, 2019 with a Go Build a FRC robot. So check them out if you want to see more. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. So. I don't think that I've got a whole lot else to talk about. Let's pull up to roll for our giveaway. Let's give our, our audience members a few more minutes here. Um, is there anything in particular that you want to mention? Anything you want to talk about before we go? Uh, there was, and I've forgotten. That's all right. Well, I know I've been really happy to have you. I've seen stuff you've done for like all of my FTC career, and it was really exciting. Um, so definitely check them out. Is there a place that people can follow you and your journey through college and into the professional career? Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can send me an email to my uh, college email. I think it's my first name, Imans, S, at uw.edu. There you or go. The University of Washington, represent there you go. Seattle. Awesome. So, so. Uh, <laughs> you don't have like an Instagram or anything? Oh, yeah, it's, it's just my name. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I figured. So yeah. I'm excited to see what you do. You just graduated high school, yes. right? So yeah. you're going to, you'll be a freshman. So I'm really excited. I think you're going to do some really great things uh, in just engineering, engineering undeclared. Engineering undeclared. So we'll see. I could, I could see a mechanical. It'd make a lot of sense. All right. So we'll go ahead and draw, we'll close our giveaway. And then we'll pick our winner for some hub shafts, some bearings, and a piece of channel. Looks like Tweedledee with a lot of ease. <laughs> uh, you're going to be our winner, just like the hoodie. Shoot us an email to marketing at gobilda.com. Let them know um, what your, like mention your Twitch username. Uh, give them your street address, including a good name to address it to. Otherwise, we might just address it to your Twitch. 
and then uh, let him know what you've won. So we'll get that sent out to you probably next week. And I heard back, I don't remember if I mentioned it, we heard back on the, um, the time we're going to open the giveaway, not the giveaway, the Strafer sponsorship, the Strafer, Strafer sponsorship. That should be early next week, maybe Monday? We'll see. So check back there, follow us uh, on social media and our newsletter for information there. All right, I think that's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for coming to our stream um, and for following along. I'm really excited. Our next FTC Friday is going to be the 19th of September at 4, uh, 4 Central. So that's 5 Eastern and 2 Pacific. So check back with us then. I think we're going to have some new parts to release. Um, so that'll be really excited. I'm really pumped to be back at live serving this year. Um, and we'll see you guys then.